I, I don't know whether you realize, but that was a terrific talk by Dr. June Jones, okay? I think um, it was quite heavy on science, and my talk is going to be a bit more heavier on religion, I think, then. That, that's a bit easier for me, you see? Um, it's also, I don't know what time is it? Seven in the evening, maybe? Maybe a bit too, yeah, maybe, maybe a bit too heavy if I keep continuing on the science bit, but, but we'll, we'll keep you engaged. Okay, the structure of my presentation is uh, basically three parts. I'm going to go to Hinduism and a history of cloning, understanding background Hindu thought and then the problems and some good things maybe about cloning. Now, uh, the first reference to cloning is actually quite ancient, greater than 6,500 BC. Um, now, if, you're, if any of you want to discuss these dates with me, you're more than welcome to come and catch me during either the break or, you know, during the discussion. Uh, Hinduism talks of demigods, devatas or deities, and the enemies, the asuras or demons. Both are born of Brahma, the creator. Now, the ancient sage, Rishi Shukrachari, who is supposed to be an immortal, i.e. his age is in uh, millions of years. Okay, so he can take almost any form. Now, this Shukracharya was the teacher of the Asuras, that is, the demons, and he was able to resurrect thousands of dead demons killed in war with the demigods. He's also supposedly able to create thousands of beings from a single spermatozoan. Fantastic, sounds fant fantastic, isn't it? It's crazy. The name Shukracharya in Sanskrit is actually the teacher who knows the secrets of sperm. Hmm. That's Shukracharya, okay? Well, something like that anyway. Nobody knows how he looks now. So. Now, the demigods, who were the enemies of the Asuras, held Shukracharya in great reverence. Okay? Their teacher, Brihaspati, sent his own son, Kacha, to learn this knowledge from Shukracharya. Shukracharya then accepted Kacha as his disciple. His own daughter, as things happen in real life, fell in love with Kacha. When the Asuras realized this, they killed Kacha. They killed him thrice. Is resurrected from death by Shukracharya each time. This knowledge used by Shukracharya, which incorporated both the resurrection of the dead and cloning, was collectively known as Sanjeevani. In Sanskrit, Sanjeevani literally means that which gives life, um, that which can be created, life which can be created. Now, that's one of the incantations which goes under the name of Sanjeevani. <coughs> So within Hinduism, the knowledge of cloning is also called Sanjeevani, said to comprise an incantation and a set of herbs. Application of the knowledge, Vidya is the Sanskrit name for that, requires repetition of the incantation. I don't know, can you think of exactly what that figure is? Two, four, followed by six zeros anyway. Five. Yeah, so uh, five zeros, thank you. Uh, according to one scripture, and this would take up at least 12 complete years of your life. So, obviously, nobody does it now, but anyway. It appears that cloning did not appear to be something that Hindus were ignorant about. Nevertheless, knowledge of its mythical application was limited to only a few people. And as you saw, he was bringing back dead demons to life. So, the demigods were constantly having to spend a lot of time fighting those dead demons and, you know, resurrect dead demons and killing them again and so on and so forth. And this is the eternal thing within, Hindu, uh, within the Hindu religion. So we're, there's a propensity for its possible misuse. Let's look at a slightly more recent and more plausible example. I don't know how many of you heard of the Mahabharata War. The Mahabharata War epic um, references, references the battle by the same name to 22nd of November, 3067 BC. And that's from the research done at the University of Memphis by Dr. Achar. Uh, it was a historical war between two feuding groups of cousins the Pandavas and the Kauravas, and they pick the details a lot of stuff, exact number of battalions, the exact battle formations on every day, figure of four million dead, which is nearly all the warriors. Now, how did that happen? Well, anyway, this is the scene from Angkor Wat in Cambodia. That's me filming in Angkor Wat with uh, the permission of the Apsara Authority. Um, the cloning angle, right, the Kauravas, one side, one entire side of this, uh, this war, numbering a hundred, were all apparently brought to life in a hundred separate jars incubated in a room for nine months. <coughs> Sounds crazy? 
Yeah, it sounds crazy. I mean, I was a big skeptic as well. An Indian scientist called Martha Purkar, who actually holds one of the patents for um, possible cloning um, in India, recently stumbled on a verse in the Mahabharata under the chapter Adi Parva, which actually describes how the Kauravas were created from a single embryo. All of those hundred were created from a single embryo from Gandhari, their mother. And Gandhari, in case, I don't know how many of you know, but Gandhari is literally ruler of Gandhar or one who comes from Gandhar, which is the present name of Kandahar in Afghanistan. <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, so according to that description, the Kauravas were created by splitting a single embryo into 100 parts, growing each part in a separate kunda or container. And that's one of the scriptures which I think survives. Okay, so now, is cloning good or bad? Is it good? How many, can I have a show of hands? How many of you think cloning is good? There you go. You got four, four hands. Yeah. Everybody else, maybe five. Sorry, I didn't count you at the back. Yeah. Everybody else thinks cloning is bad. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Can I look another way? Good, bad, or neutral? Okay. Neutral. You're neutral. Neutral. Okay. Fine. Neutral. Very good. Yeah. No problem. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't uh, uh, get the person in the middle. Yeah. Okay. Now, before we attempt to answer this question from the Hindu theological point of view, because um, I'm a Hindu, although. Um, a lot of people have mistaken me for a Christian at some point, uh, and possibly a Muslim as well, occasionally. But but anyway, I'm going to speak about this. So you know, from the Hindu point of view, so we have to try and understand the basis of the Hindu viewpoint and thought process. Uh, there's this concept of Atma in Hinduism, Atma or soul. Now many people, when you ask, you go around a campus anywhere and you ask people about a soul, and I used to say this as well when I was 22. So I would say I have a soul, and in Hindu thought, this is absurd. It's completely absurd. Because the I here refers to the body consciousness. In Sanskrit, you would call it Deha Buddhi or bodily intelligence. And the thought process that this body has a soul is, in Hinduism, it's, it's, it's the other way around, you see. Because I am the soul. I am the Atma. Or quite simply, this is why learned masters will say, I am. So, I, I like to have this analogy, analogy, which is my analogy, which is um, the soul is a tenant which can be kicked out at any time by the landlord who is God. Yeah? Okay. Now, the Atma or soul cannot be burned, cannot be dried, cannot be cut, may not be destroyed. It's eternal, it's free, it's not definitively condemned to hell. Therefore, in Hinduism, possibly, possibly, there is no need for a savior God unlike the Semitic or Judeo-Christian faiths. So the individual soul is but the reflection of the universal soul of God. I hope this is making some sense. It's, a, it's quite complicated. It took me a long time to understand this myself. Anyway, and then there's a concept of Hindu time. Now this is verifiable. This is astronomy. The current age is said to have started on February 5th midnight in what we call as the year 3102 BC. This is the shortest stage. The year before, the age before that is double what the current age runs. The current age, the worst of them all, by the way, supposedly, called Kali Yoga, will run for, again, uh, is that 432000 years? Yeah, therefore, in the 5080th year of Kali Yoga. So the problem is, such, this is a very long concept of time, you see, and then this time ends, but then it doesn't end completely, it's cyclical. So you then have something which is four times that number in years, and that starts. So this ensures that Hinduism is not too susceptible to ideas that the world is ending anytime soon. And at that time, it is said that this, um, this figure on a steed, uh, which is said to be Kalki, which is said to be a downward projection of God into, uh, uh, into the world of humans as a human, and he will come with all his supernatural powers and he'll annihilate the decadent humans, and he'll save a few who are still left and pious and righteous, etc., and then time will start again. Okay, fine. So what's God's place in all this? So God is one. He can manifest in anything and anybody, and I'm sure you must have, or some of you must have heard, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vadanti, which is, the truth is one, or God is one, but scholars interpret it according to their own understanding. So it's a bit like an elephant and five blind men is that's my yeah, or five blindfolded men is my, that's my slightly better anal an analogy. My other analogy is the diamond concept. So 
God is a diamond bigger than the sun with innumerable facets. I'm sure you know how big the sun is. And then each facet is thousands of miles wide. You stood in front of one facet, you'd only see that one facet and not the whole diamond. And each facet is a religion from the Hindu point of view. So you reach that facet, you've actually reached God, yes. But you actually also only reached an aspect of God. Now within Hinduism, therefore, the whole idea has been to try and become one with that entire diamond, to actually penetrate that facet and become one with, the, with God. Now, what's karma? So the concept of karma, well, Gandhi made this very famous uh, statement. He said, God made the law of karma and retired. So, he said, so basically, it, it, you might be devoted to God, but if you're killing 100 people a day, it's not going to really matter. So while devotion to God is important, doing good deeds is far more important. Because the law of karma was made by the divine, it cannot fail to react once the action is completed. Okay, so now, that, that's the bit on, you know, so because otherwise it's very, very difficult to understand where a Hindu is actually coming from. Right, so what are the pros? Now, I think you've already seen a lot of the stem cell bit from uh, Dr. June Jones, and I think she's done a f fantastic job of it. Now, I'm going to skim over this. Uh, because otherwise, I think it will be virtually it's virtually impossible to cover all aspects of this anyway. But now, cloning can therefore produce genetically identical cells, a large number of tissues, even organs, which can possibly used be used for transplantation. And such transplantation, as uh, you've already seen, which does not require immunosuppressive drugs. So, can you imagine what that would be? I don't know how many of you are medical students or doctors over here. This will eventually lead to a reduction in the suffering of individuals and their families. So this is definitely, this is, this is, this is true, okay? Now, from the Hindu point of view, actually from virtually any point of view, if an individual or group or family have a reduction in its suffering, then ultimately somewhere there is good karma being committed. Because every human is a spark of the divine, because God made man in, in his image. Making even one person better is a big step a big step along the road in making God happy too. Yeah. Right. Now the law of karma and cloning. Now, I think mammalian uh, cloning. So animal cloning is you've all heard of Dolly the sheep. Uh, do you know how many attempts it took for Dolly the sheep to be made? 277. And then you see that this is the problem. So what happened to the other 277 attempts? So they all died. I think if I'm if I remember right, three made it to the stage of the embryo, and one uh, or three three were actually born, if I remember right. Right. So what is the cloning for? And in this country, of course, the, all these I think some of these questions do, are not quite um, that important. But these questions will eventually become important, as you see, as I as I was speaking a bit earlier. Regulation is all very good. We are going to regulate everything over here perfectly, I think. I think we are very good at doing stuff like that. In the United States also, I think it will be okay. But what will happen is that there will be countries in which none of this will ever be regulated. There will be countries. My own, my own country, the country I came from, India, this will not be regulated. It's already happening. People are already giving, you know, she, she remarked on stem cells being infused. I know places where they are doing it. They're actually just doing it willy-nilly, okay? So if cloning actually comes about, well, I don't know what the hell will happen. But all hell might just break loose, okay? Okay, right, okay. Is it to help some person, some animal with a disability? Are humans or animals being brought to life simply to be then sacrificed for somebody's benefit? I'm just putting up all these questions here because you can then ask me and all of us during the discussion, you see, what exactly is being killed? Is it tissue or is it an identifiable entity? This is important. Is it just tissue or is it actually somebody? Now, to answer that, the weighing of karmic deed versus the benefit of the deed is the theological question. So both tissue and identity being cloned will actually produce karma. If a mammal or human is being cloned, then that has far greater repercussions than tissue. The same way within Hinduism that uh, being vegetarian is not necessary, it's your own choice. But the karmic repercussions of being non-vegetarian are simply related to the animal actually having an identity and not wanting, wanting to be killed. The vegetable doesn't run away from you. You see, the animal does. The animal doesn't want to be killed. It's as simple as that. See, nobody explains it like that, but anyway, here I go. 
Okay, boom. <laughs> anyway, okay, so the Atma and soul and cloning. Now, the, people say, okay, so does this clone actually have a soul? Well, even if the scientist actually clones a single entity, man or animal, the man is not really going to create anything beyond the body. The soul is actually indestructible. So all you have to do is tap into the divine creative process which already exists. Okay. Now, when does the soul enter a body? Okay, because this is again important as far as cloning goes. So unlike Judeo-Christian theory, the Hindus ascribe a soul to the living tissues only at four months. So only from the four month stage. So we talked about how the cells, um, I think uh, they're just cells basically is what Dr. Jones was saying in the blastosis stage, uh, so just before the blastosis stage. So here, only from the four month stage is the, is the fetus deemed as having a soul. So any tissue which has a life less than four months will not supposedly attract as much karma as a living identity when cloned. So what do people find so problematic about cloning? Well, one is a possibility of creation without parents, though it's usually just creation from a single parent. Now, if and when human cloning becomes possible and might be quite some time, then you have to ask these questions. Would it be possible to clone children in a, in a lab? Can a person be replaced by his or her clone? I mean, these are things which some, I think some of the films have actually explored more than perhaps science. What if somebody actually decided to clone Hitler's talent? Would they be very similar to what they were when they lived some time ago? Is cloning contrary to what nature intended? Does a clone lack a soul? Can a clone child be used to harm others? So I'm going to address some of these over here. So does a clone lack a soul? So that's, that's absurd because in Hindu thought, it's the divine spark, which is the reflection of God, which is the cause of that body actually living. So without the soul, there's no physical life. And the soul is by definition pure and free. Now, can a clone replace a person? Well, scientists argue that because nurture is as important as nature, this would be likely impossible as the clone would be actually very different. Now, that's the statement which, which we normally hear. So is this true? Okay, how can we learn a bit more about this? So the MTFS was the Minnesota twin family study, which began in, I think, June 1989 using same gender twins from ages 11 to 17. I think in 1979, Thomas Bouchard began, began studying these twins who were separated at birth and reared in different families. And what he found was that an identical twin reared away from his or her co-twin had about an equal chance of being similar to the co-twin in terms of personality, <coughs> interests, attitudes as one who has been reared with his or her co-twin. So the similarities between the identical twins were known to be genetic in nature. So they will be different, but how much different they will be, nobody will know until it's actually done. So, I mean, identical twins are somewhat different from clones because you've got two parents there and you've got a single one over here. But for our purpose, we can use that example. So clone may be quite similar, except for one thing. Again, in Hindu thought, the womb of the mother who bears the child also carries importance. Okay, anyway. I think there will be some differences between a clone and the person from whom the clone arose. I don't, I don't know what you think, but it's certainly a, you know something worth thinking about. Can a clone replace a person or a pet who has died? So now here we come to this thing. Would wealthy people who have lost their offspring or whatever be simply able to clone them? There's somebody who's actually suggested that the terms replacement cloning already to describe the generation of a clone of a previously living person. Would less wealthy people who can't afford, because I'm sure all this will be very, very expensive. So don't think about affording it, any of this stuff. But anyway, would less wealthy people who lost a pet be simply able to clone them? Would death actually have any meaning at all? Now, there are many parallels between the debates on cloning and IVF. The difference is, of course, the removal of one conjugal partner. The problem is when the human, and some of these debates actually took place a long time ago with IVF, but when a human is deficient in some way, one of two people or both are deficient, and science can provide that answer to successfully fill that deficiency, only one outcome will happen. Because there's demand and there's supply. And when you want something and there is something which can actually happen, so if science marches forward, then they will possibly, regardless 
of legislation, regulation, I think will become a necessity for those people who will go to the ends of the earth to try and get hold of this baby or clone or whatever it is. Anyway, right. This will also increase the number of surrogates, but with all the attendant problems of surrogacy, <coughs> presuming that these are being produced in a female womb. Now, the specific problems with human cloning, is, one is the high rate of failure. As I've said a bit earlier, Dolly the sheep succeeded after, I think, 277 attempts. The current success rate is 0.1 to 3%. What will happen to the numerous failures? Will the clone actually express the right genes at the right time? I'm calling it programming. So you're actually getting somebody to program this stuff. Right. In Hindu thought, life and death are in the hands of the law of karma which was made by God. One may conclude those failures were destined. So some, some Hindus believe that those failures were destined. Scripture states that the people involved may carry the karma for such an activity. What are the other problems? Well, this, this process called persistence cloning, which some people say could finish off the aging process, although there's still many problem, problems with this, and this is a long, long way off. There's a population problem. The world's population stands at 7 billion plus humans. It's rising. And the population of India, for example, is now at 1.25 billion, uh, 25 million, billion, billion, keep forgetting, and rising. It was 800 million when I left med school. That was just 20 years ago. <coughs> Last 60 years, I've seen a tremendous increase in the duration and quality of life for some modern humans. The environmental cost of the human in interventions is colossal. There's, uh, I think, one of the scientists who said recently that I don't know whether a global warming will persist or this or that. You know, I don't think man will ever destroy nature, but nature will certainly destroy man if we continue like this. So, can the Earth bear the burden of all this stuff, cloning? Because I don't think all the regulation we can do over here. You see, there's countries where none of that will ever, you know, none of that will be practicable. Imagine a world without sickness, aging, perhaps even death. I mean, not for all, but for a few. Will nature be able to bear this? If nature cannot bear this burden, then the question is whether we will survive. Is cloning of humans really needed in a world of humans who will perhaps destroy the natural resources and therefore themselves anyway? I'm being very pessimistic, aren't I? Perhaps, yeah. Anyway. But, you know, I'm, I'm an optimistic uh, person normally, but I think with cloning, perhaps I've become a bit more pessimistic. But anyway, if humans are cloned in laboratories, will this lead to a culture which is even more materialistic than the present? If somebody dies, will their clone be made available in a made-to-order fashion somewhere? I mean, this is all very theoretical because I think if you've seen with Dolly the sheep, it took so many attempts to actually get one sheep made. So I think this is far, far away off. But I think maybe in our time, maybe 40 years, 50 years, this will happen. What what value would human life have? Okay, anyway, so those are my films. Yeah. I hope I wasn't too pessimistic.